one. This is the, the main topic of today's training. What does coding mean in kindergarten, first or second grade? When I tell people that I work for a company that teaches elementary students to code, I often get uh, skeptical responses. People saying, really? How, does, how exactly does that work? Are, are those kids really learning how to code? And I get the skepticism. When we think of coding, we often think of you know, a, a, a person working alone in a dark room with a glowing computer screen writing sentences and sentences of this uh, random jarble of symbols and numbers and text. So it's not going to look like that, but yes, I'm here to tell you that kids can code. It'll look different than this picture we have in our head, but they can do it. So that's what the first part of our chat will be about. We're gonna break down some assumptions about what is coding and what does it mean for our youngest students. So what is coding? At its core, coding means giving a computer clear instructions in a language it understands to produce a specific result. In other words, it's telling a computer what to do, and we can't do that just by telling it what to do in English or any other human speaking language. We do that with code. That's the language that computers understand. Like I said, you might picture someone coding like this. Maybe they're working in isolation. They're writing lines and lines and lines of letters and numbers and symbols. And this is what coding might look like for a lot of adults in certain settings. But when we talk about kids coding, we are definitely referring to something different. We would not expect our elementary students to type lines and lines of syntax in front of a screen for hours. We know that that's not developmentally appropriate or interesting for them at all. However, kids can absolutely do what this definition of coding describes. They can give a computer really clear instructions to produce a result, to have some sort of outcome. So this is what we mean when we say kids can code. And you might ask, well, if kids aren't typing out lines of code, then how exactly are they still coding? What does coding mean in this case? And typically, effective K2 coding apps or resources will employ some sort of drag and drop interactive, something that engages fine motor skills that might cater to pre-readers with symbols and shapes and colors, as opposed to text and words. So this picture on the right, this is an example of a young student working in Codable, and you can see already that it's a bit more interactive than that picture prior where you're just typing on a keyboard. Kids coding can be really visual, really interactive and engaging, and it doesn't have to be like what we sometimes picture adults doing when they're coding. So let's dive in a little bit more to what K kindergarten, first, second, or really elementary school in general, what coding can be like? What else is out there? So one way to teach young students to code is through block-based coding. And you might have seen examples of block-based coding. Maybe it's in a recommended curriculum for you to use or just through your own research of examples like Scratch Junior, that's what you see here, um, regular Scratch, so here's this example, code.org does block-based coding. There's a lot of other options as well. These platforms utilize some sort of drag and drop learning environment where learners use these coding instructional blocks. You can see those colorful blocks that sort of snap together like puzzle pieces in a certain order to create their code those instructions we talked about on the last slide, the, the instructions you're giving to a computer. So that's an example of block-based coding, coding that is appropriate for younger students. And then another way to teach K2 students to code is through game-based puzzles, game-based tasks. So here is an example in Codable. This is a game-based puzzle that also employs a drag and drop mechanic so students are dragging those arrow commands or those other commands up into those boxes in a certain order, just like in block-based coding where they link together in a certain order, um, that will produce some sort of result in the game. So in the codable example, 
um, students are putting arrow commands in order to tell a little fuzzy character what directions to roll through the maze. So in both examples, in block-based coding and in the codable game-based puzzle, there is a program, there's code somewhere on the screen, and then there's also a stage. And the stage is the outcome. It's showing what the code, what the code does. It's having some sort of a, a cause and effect. And that's a really strong connection for our young students to make. So when we think about why this works, why these platforms really work for young students to learn how to code, it's because there is that sensory feedback to every action. Changing the code or the input will change the output, so what the learner sees or hears. And students can utilize a lot of tools and resources that they might use in other subjects, like the scientific method when they're learning to code. So they're forming hypotheses about what their code will do, and then they actually get to see the outcome, what the code actually did. And if there's something wrong in the code, if one of those blocks are out of order or it's the wrong arrow command, then they'll be able to see it immediately. That feedback is right there. They'll know that their code has a bug and then they can, search, they can go out and try to start fixing it. So these platforms work to teach kids to code because they're visual, they're interactive, and they're oftentimes, um, there's many possible solutions. So there's not just one single way that a kid can solve a game-based puzzle or put together a block-based code there's many possible solutions to serve all different types of students. I do want to say that K2 coding does not only need to take place online or on tech devices. I would say it's a little easier because if it's online, then students can iterate faster. And if they make a mistake, they can change it and try something new a little bit faster than if they were writing with pen or paper. But there are tons of unplugged pen and paper coding options that are a wonderful way to engage and get started with coding. So if you don't have tech devices or you don't have one-to-one -one devices, that doesn't need to be the reason why you don't pursue coding in your classroom. Here are some examples of worksheets that engage some of the similar computational thinking skills that those online coding platforms do. And you can find a lot of these on our website, but we've also seen some awesome examples on Teachers Pay Teachers or Pinterest or blogs. There's a lot of options out there if you don't have tech devices for your students. So how exactly do these programs teach kids to code? We know why they might work, but what are kids actually learning from these different types of programs? They're doing two main things. The first is that they are helping learners develop a real understanding of coding concepts. The fundamental concepts like sequencing, so putting things in order, conditional statements, so if-then statements, which are like, if something happens, then something else will happen. That's a core coding concept. Also loops, so having some sort of repetition, debugging, solving problems. These core coding concepts students can learn in kindergarten or even before. So they are able to learn some of the main coding concepts that they would then use uh, for their entire coding trajectory. And the reason why it's possible for kids to learn about these fundamentals at such a young age is because there are truly examples of all of these concepts all around us. These coding concepts all have a real world analogy that kids have likely already seen, they've already experienced, and the role of a coding teacher is just to help them reframe it. When we teach code, we're helping them draw on this existing knowledge around the world and apply it in a new way. So a good example might be sequence, putting something in order. Your students have likely followed some sort of set of instructions in their life. Maybe they've put together a Lego build where they followed step-by-step -step instructions. Perhaps they've executed a recipe, they've baked something and they followed step-by-step -step instructions. They know that if one of their instructions are out of order, then the thing won't happen the way that they expect. So they've seen examples of sequence and we just reframe it. We say, just like you follow a recipe step-by-step, -step, 
your computer is going to follow your instructions and code step by step. There's really clear links and that's why it's possible for even our youngest students to, um, to learn the concepts and to learn how to code. Um, and I do see, I have a comment um, on the side from Mona who's asking if we have vocabulary cards for the coding concepts and we do have vocabulary cards um, at Codable. We're happy to connect you with those. And if you want to create your own, it's pretty easy to put these words onto cards and then to have them up in your classroom. So that way, if you see an example of sequence in an everyday life throughout the school day, you can point to it and make that connection a little bit clearer. So that's a great question. And then the second way that kids coding programs can help teach kids to code, besides just learning the coding concepts, is to help develop a coding mindset. And this is a really core piece of why it's important to teach kids to code, especially at a young age. So we're talking about skills that coders have that can benefit students in all walks of their life. So this includes, you know, creative problem solving, resilience, creativity, logical thinking, knowing when to ask for help. These are skills that will permeate into all other subjects and not just be helpful when learning to code. I always like to say that these programs are doing both of these things at the same time, and that's why they're really effective learning tools. Now, because coding education is drawing on such a wide range of personal skills, the way that coding looks in a K2 classroom is going to be hugely diverse and different from class to class. The way that your students code and engage with these coding platforms is going to be totally different from the way students in another classroom might engage with the same tools. So I just wanted to show some images of what K2 coding might look like. Sometimes it could be head down focus I remember when I was um, teaching my middle schoolers how to code, there were some class periods where it was totally silent. You could hear a pin drop, nobody was talking, they were all in flow and really focused on their work. But most of the time, I would say because coding is so fun, it might be a little bit more lively than other classes. So there could be cheering and pointing and leaning into each other, hands up, talking, chatter. Um, it, there's, there's a little bit of a spark in the classroom when kids are, are learning how to code because it's a new skill and it's something that's engaging all of those, uh, those coding mindsets that I mentioned on the last slide. So there will also be uh, some frustrated sighs and some, you know, some noises that are indicating that kids are, are stuck and that's also the beauty of coding. They will ask their classmates or find a way on their own to solve the problems and that's important too.